Darwin saw small changes and convinced himself that this could lead to almost unlimited change. Mendel showed that this was not true. The small changes Darwin had seen were due to recombination of genes which allows only limited variation. Recombination is a brilliant aspect of the design of all creatures. It allows them to vary enough to cope with changes in their environment, but not to change into another kind of creature. Evolutionists now call this variation within a kind microevolution. But Darwin was so convinced that enough of such variations would add up to major change that he predicted the fossil record would be teeming with transitional forms showing gradual change from one kind to another. He wrote, He who rejects these views on the nature of the geological record will rightly reject my whole theory. We've been told for more than a hundred years that the fossil record does show such gradual change in creatures from one kind to another. But it's not true. The fossil record never shows any variation other than that due to gene recombination. But the best in the field dictum didn't allow anyone to say so. Richard Goldschmidt let the cat out of the bag when he admitted that there are no transitions in the fossil record. Goldschmidt was not the first to realise that so-called microevolution could not lead to evolution, but he was the first influential scientist to admit it. He said the decisive step in evolution, the first step to macroevolution, the step from one species to another, requires an other evolutionary method than that of sheer accumulation of micromutations. He realised to cross from one kind to another a major jump was essential and he promoted the hopeful monster theory. He speculated that a dinosaur must have laid an egg and a bird hatched out. That didn't appeal to the scientific establishment and it was not accepted. Stephen Jay Gould put forward a more acceptable theory called punctuated equilibrium, which soon became known as punk eek. In this theory, we find no record of evolution in the rocks because change happened only in small, isolated communities, and it happened so quickly that it never got preserved in the rock record. When the transformation was finished, the newly evolved creatures rapidly populated the world and got fossilised as fully evolved new creatures, which then remained unchanged until they disappeared from the fossil record. For a while, punk eek was eagerly accepted, so it was possible to think punk eek was going to become the best in the field hypothesis. The truth about Darwin's failed story could be admitted. So Gould felt confident in saying, the extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. But since Darwin's gradualism had not yet been rejected, Gold went on, Darwin's argument still persists as the favoured escape of most paleontologists from the embarrassment of a record that seems to show so little of evolution. It was never seen in the rocks. And he finished off with the sobering confession, we fancy ourselves as the only true students of life's history. Yet, to preserve our favoured account of evolution by natural selection, we view our data as so bad that we never see the very process we profess to study. So the lies about there being transitions fossils between one kind of creature and another were fully acknowledged as being lies. But sadly for Gould, punk eek soon went out of favour. Vast amounts of evidence showed that inbreeding among small populations does not lead to evolution, 
but to degeneration. So Gould went back to towing Darwin's line like all the other obedient scientists, because Darwin's discredited story was still the best in the field. But scientists knew that the story being told to the public was untrue. Professor George Wald of Harvard University admitted there are only two possibilities as to how life arose. One is spontaneous generation arising to evolution. The other is a supernatural creative act of God. There is no third possibility. Spontaneous generation, that life arose from non-living matter, was scientifically disproved 120 years ago by Louis Pasteur and others. That leaves us with the only possible conclusion that life arose as a supernatural creative act of God. I will not accept that philosophically, because I do not want to believe in God. Therefore, I choose to believe in that which I know is scientifically impossible, spontaneous generation arising to evolution. This admitted acceptance of a lie may be connected to being awarded the Nobel Prize. The scientific establishment had made it very clear that anyone not towing their line will be banned from receiving Nobel Prizes. Fred Hoyle, for example, did work so outstanding that he'd had to receive one. But Hoyle had written that evolution was nonsense of a high order. He published a book, The Intelligent Universe, in which he noted the creation of the universe, like the solution of the Rubik Cube, requires an intelligence. So his prize could not be given to him. It was given to a minor collaborator. Scientists know that if they go against the scientific establishment, they will be discredited, ostracized, denied publication of their research, and will definitely not be allowed a Nobel Prize. The establishment's scientists tell us that science is a self-correcting discipline, which is constantly rejecting old mistakes and replacing them with new discoveries. What they do not tell the public is that only real science, the science that follows the scientific method, does that. The scientific method decrees that if any observation contradicts a hypothesis or theory, it must be abandoned. The secular scientist hides from the public the fact that the scientific establishment has abandoned that clause and replaced it by the best in the field dictum. If any observation contradicts a hypothesis or theory, it remains valid until a materialistic alternative has been accepted by the scientific establishment. Many scientists themselves know full well that evolution is totally disproved. They know full well that they're telling us lies. They refuse to abandon their soundly disproved theory of evolution because it is deemed to be the best in the field. We can see why Soren Lovetrup wrote, I believe that one day the Darwinian myth will be ranked the greatest deceit in the history of science. A few years ago, I gave a series of lectures in Chicago. Afterwards, I talked with the biologist, Dr. Joel Duff. He was very unhappy with my lecture on evolution. I asked him if anything that I had said was not true. He admitted that what I had said was true. So I asked him why biologists like himself don't tell the public the truth. He said, we cannot tell the public the truth about evolution. They would not understand and would be confused. So that's what the evolutionist elite think of poor, ignorant fools like you and me. We are just too stupid to understand. But I think the truth is actually that if they told us the truth, we would agree fully with Soren Lovetrup that evolution should be ranked the greatest deceit 
in the history of science. We should note that they refuse to accept the truth only because they refuse to accept the existence of God. And that should challenge all of us. Are we going to be like George Wald and say, I don't want to believe in God, so I refuse to believe the truth? Or are we going to be like Anthony Flew and accept that the evidence is so overwhelming that God must exist, whether we welcome that truth or not? Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.